Some might think that school teachers work six hours a day, five days a week and enjoy long holidays throughout the year. But in recent years, studies have found their reality to be far different. I remember so clearly like driving to the previous school I was working at, thinking, oh my God, if someone just crashed, that in, if someone crashed into me now, that would solve so many problems. My 14 hour day would start at 7am to give me enough time to finalise preparations from the previous day. As soon as I entered the school gates, the pressure started immediately. Someone I worked with, he had a young kid and he was telling me that every time he went home his youngest would cry when he picked them up because they just didn't know who he was. So that's the kind of scope that teachers are facing when they go back home. Health and safety executives say these workers are the most stressed in Britain. And according to a national education survey, only 15% of teachers feel their workload is manageable all or most of the time with Ofsted inspections, lack of support staff and pressure to increase exam grades amongst the top causes of stress. The question is, are teachers at breaking point? I know quite a lot of teachers who have struggled with mental illness, largely as a result of being in the classroom and being in education. 76% of education workers have experienced psychological or physical symptoms due to their work. That's according to the 2018 Teacher Wellbeing Index. This is something that Madeline Highland, a former teacher from Buckinghamshire, is all too familiar with. She quit the classroom after the pressures of teaching caused her to suffer a mental breakdown. She says for her, anxiety and teaching went hand in hand. I used to fear going into work, into school so much that I would have done pretty much anything not to have to face it. I remember so clearly like driving to the previous school I was working at, thinking, oh my God, if someone just crashed, that in, if someone crashed into me now, that would solve so many problems because I wouldn't have to face anything. And there was nothing to face, like everything was fine to everyone else. I was just terrified of doing a bad job. But as it got worse, I do remember, I never did it, but I remember thinking I could just swerve now or like there's a lorry, this would be my chance. In the mornings before work when it was really difficult, I would i don't know how seriously I'd consider throwing myself down the stairs, but the thought very regularly would happen where I'd think well, that I just, I couldn't go in. I was having panic attacks, three or four panic attacks a day. I couldn't leave the house. Um, I couldn't see my friends, I couldn't put the television on, I couldn't open up a computer because of the link to doing that when I was working, I couldn't, it took years for me to be able to open a laptop because the feeling of terror that I used to have about work, opening work emails didn't go away for a long time. And yeah, I just, I kind of just stopped functioning, I couldn't go to the shops, I couldn't drive, I was very sick quite a lot of the time and I, yeah, I just had these very regular panic attacks that could happen at any point in the night or in the day. So what kind of pressures are teachers in the UK, like Madeline, facing? So the school I moved to was anticipating an Ofsted inspection. So every meeting we had was about how we have to be outstanding for Ofsted, which in my head was like, this doesn't make sense. Like We have to be outstanding for the students that we teach. It's not to tick a box. But that didn't seem to, it was all about, you know, getting the grade. So we had a Mockstead, so a fake Ofsted in the, the October of that first term, where we were all graded, they came round, they basically were Ofsted, but pretend. And I was selected as one of the teachers to perform. So that had to be outstanding, obviously. I was then called in to be part of this panel that were talking about like, how do we take the school from good to outstanding? I'd never been in a situation where every single result had to be justified. It felt like you were in a massive magnifying glass and everything you did, anything, and it wasn't usually me, it was usually one of my team that didn't quite meet the mark, was like this huge red flag and why isn't it this and what are you going to do about it and not, well hang on, that student is really difficult and it doesn't really come down to the teacher in this instance, it's down to the student. It wasn't that, it was what are you doing? And then you'd get an email from a parent. What are you doing wrong with my child? I used to have students coming to me with lists of things that they didn't like about the way their teacher taught. Things that they criticised about their lesson. I've told mum about this and she says it's not acceptable for a teacher to be doing this in the classroom, like drinking a coffee or whatever. It felt like 
you couldn't do right. It felt, unless you were, unless you were outstanding all the time. So I was outstanding all the time and I didn't have to deal with that scrutiny, except it was breaking me. But none of my staff were, because it's not fair. You can't be that good all the time. It's not, it's not normal. Victoria Hewitt, a secondary school teacher from Kent, is also familiar with these pressures. She came close to leaving the profession altogether in 2016 when she experienced a mental breakdown in front of her class. She has since moved schools. The factors that contributed to my breakdown um, was definitely the workload. It was just excessive. There was regular scrutinies, book looks. We had regular observations. I recently came across my lesson observation sheets and there were 39 um, from a period of a year and a bit and it just shows you how regular those observations were, um, partly because we were a new school, but partly because there was just such a high expectation of staff there as well. And there's that drive for excellence and, and outstanding. I did keep a workload diary just to kind of look at where I was putting my time and, and what was taking me so long in order to then take that to my head teacher to kind of ask for a bit of help about how to reduce that workload. And in that there were um, writing exams, uh, print, lots of printing, creating lesson resources, differentiated resources. There were things like um, ob observations and writing paperwork that went with the observations. Um, and all of that was leading to me working about 60 to 70 hours a week on average. Some weeks I would work slightly less, but it'd be dependent on what was going on that week. But most of the time I was working 60 to 70 hours in order to get all the work done that was expected. Now, the suicide rate for primary and nursery school teachers alone in England is almost twice the national average. That's according to the Office of National Statistics. But is there a link between suicide and stress rates and the pressures that teachers are currently facing? I spoke to a primary school teacher who says the stress of her workload is causing her to suffer from severe depression. She asked to remain anonymous. The following is a reconstruction. When I first started teaching, I wanted to make a difference to every child in my care. I knew that teaching is a hard working profession, but nothing could have prepared me for the pressures I was put under daily. My 14 hour day would start at 7am to give me enough time to finalise preparations from the previous day. As soon as I entered the school gates, the pressure started immediately. There would always be memos from colleagues and the leadership team asking for something. Then there would be staff meetings or morning briefings. Sometimes these meetings were needless and I would always be thinking that I could be best spending my time preparing things in the classroom. Then there would often be a parent to call in a queue at the photocopier. All these things would just compound the stress and anxiety levels before I even began to start teaching. Daily assessments, weekly assessments, half-termly assessments, end-of-term assessments and end-of-year assessments would become a time-consuming process. Daily, weekly and termly targets and two sets of school reports to write every year. These would take an average of three hours per child. I have been signed off of work with depression and work-related stress and have been taking antidepressant tablets for the past six months. At my lowest, my depression was so severe that I contemplated suicide. I felt nauseous every night before bed and on average only had three to four hours of sleep. I would always have a notepad by my bedside in case I woke up with a thought or idea for the next day. This meant I was waking up constantly throughout the night. I thought about taking my own life because I thought that I was a failure. I was full of negativity and detached myself from my family because I was almost void of mental stability. I would forget important things and even would zone out mid-conversation. My appetite weakened and I lost a considerable amount of weight. The thought of stepping into my classroom makes me feel physically sick to the point I gag when someone talks about schools or if I see something related to schools on the TV. I am seriously considering throwing in the towel as the pressure is just too much to cope with. With these experiences in mind, it appears that workload and long working hours are serious issues for those in the teaching profession. But what effect must these factors be having on a person's family life? A survey by the National Education Union found that 81% of teachers have considered quitting the profession in the last year due to increasing pressure and heavy workload with 40% saying they spend over 21 hours a week outside of the classroom, working evenings and weekends. 
That's almost 40% more hours than the average full-time worker. Phil Duncalf, who was pictured on the official Get Into Teaching banner, left the profession last year with no job to go to. He said his biggest challenge with the job was finding the time to spend with his family. It, it's that continual pressure to, to be better that's happening in education, so you're constantly reviewed uh, throughout the year. You've got performance management targets, you've got people that pop into your classroom. Whether they're reviewing your lesson or not, it's just that there is a constant accountability. Sometimes you'd get feedback, sometimes they'd come into your lesson for 10 minutes and then leave it and you wouldn't know what they thought and so uh, some people struggle with that because they don't, they don't know if that was because of their teaching or because of they were just showing a visitor around. Uh, so some schools are better than others. I had a previous school I worked at, they would actually give you a little feedback sheet every time they popped into your lesson. Again, sometimes that was helpful, sometimes it felt like you're being critiqued again. So with that pressure, you go home and, and I, I would have to work after dinner. Dur during the week, oftentimes evenings were like not for family. They'd, they'd be having to mark books, having to uh, plan lessons. There was one particular week where I had a church event, I had a parents' evening, I had marking, and I had some health visits for my daughter all in the same week and uh, I think I, I managed to talk to my wife for about half an hour in total through that week and we got to the, the Saturday where we, um, we had some time together and we just, I hadn't been able to catch up on what health visits were about, what was going on with my daughter at the time. So it was, it's a fairly substantial impact on my family. So my daughter was, has been diagnosed now with a rare syndrome called Rett syndrome. And uh, leading up to that diagnosis, there were multiple visits to hospitals. We were quite near the hospital we needed to go to and the appointment would have been quite quick, probably about an hour or two. So I asked for a couple periods off and I was able to work the rest of the day. So just be two periods out. The response was, I can take one paid, one unpaid. I then asked how much was unpaid, how much would I lose out on, and it worked out about 40 quid per period. And so basically I had to make the decision of whether I would lose out on 80 quid or I'd go to my hospital appointment for my daughter. Considering the situation we were in, I felt it was right to go to my daughter, but the, the pressure on a member of staff and, and then just the resentment, it was a natural resentment to feel like, come on, it's my daughter. And, and it just, it, it wasn't the reason that I left teaching, but it just added to an accumulation of reasons. Um, and that one's quite a significant one. If you can't be there for your family, then you, you have to think about changing jobs. Just an anecdote from, from someone I worked with as well. He had a young kid at the time, and he was telling me that every time he went home, his young, youngest would cry when he picked them up because they just didn't know who he was. So that's the kind of scope that teachers are facing when they go back home. Teaching staff absence in secondary schools cost us an average of over £310,000 per school per year. That's according to Teach Well Alliance a company that partners with schools to help reduce workload. Steve Waters, an ex-teacher from Manchester, is the founder. He believes that reducing workload will in turn reduce teacher absence and will ultimately have a positive impact on students. We are asking teachers to support the mental health and well-being of pupils, but we're not paying very much attention to the same mental health and well-being of teachers. Schools as employers have a duty of care towards teachers and there are some excellent schools that are performing that duty of care. There are other schools who don't really include that in health and safety. The individual teacher suffering from mental health and uh, the stress of the job also deserves to have individual support. Schools are losing teachers, their retention rates are low and vacancies are going unfilled and when vacancies go unfilled it means that pupils are being taught by teachers who are on supply or who are brought in to do um, a short-term job and while some of them are excellent the turnover is quite high so pupils don't get a consistent person in front of them 
and that has an impact on their attainment and on their behaviour and their well-being. If a teacher is burnt out and, and they're unable to come into school and they have to be covered by somebody, then the cost of a school is about £200 a day extra to bring somebody in to cover that class. And of course that is on top of the salary that they have to pay the teacher who is absent. And if that teacher has been teaching a substantial number of years, then it means that the school can be paying up to six months full pay. So the financial cost is huge, but there's also a personal cost in that high turnover of teachers because teachers are ill and having a number of short-term appointments coming in to cover those classes, it can be destabilising and the children can start to feel that they're not getting a good deal and then that can lead to poor behaviour and poor behaviour then can lead to poor results. So it has an all-encompassing effect on the school and although it sounds obvious that you should look after your teachers to combat all of those factors, the evidence is that far too many schools are not doing that. So, will it continue to be an uphill battle for teachers, or is anything being done to reduce the stresses they're facing? Well, a spokesperson for Ofsted said, We recognise the impact that excessive workload has on teachers, and have been working with both the government and profession to reduce this as much as possible. Our new education inspection framework, which will take effect in September, is intended to support this. We're proposing that inspectors focus more on the curriculum and less on internal data. This will mean that teachers can focus on the things that made them join the profession in the first place, helping pupils learn a great curriculum through great teaching. For the first time, the framework will also look at how well leaders manage teachers' workload. Our inspectors will be checking the assessment is not used in a way that creates unnecessary burdens for staff or learners. I have also contacted the Department for Education for comment, but as of yet, I haven't received a response. So just how important is it that schools support their teachers and their mental well-being? Abigail Mann, the head of English at a school in London, thinks it's crucial. She's aiming to tackle stress and burnout amongst the staff and students at her school by avoiding unnecessary tasks, sending positive messages and reducing workload. I caught up with Abby to find out a bit more about the impact this is having. We have a wellbeing trophy that people are awarded each week and it's passed on to somebody else who's, who's been recognised for their um, approach to wellbeing or something that they've done that week that's impressed somebody else. I do wellbeing bags for my team, which are basically bags with lots of little treats and goodies in and they get those quite regularly throughout the year. We also have a, an office which is full of photographs of all of our days out and we have a wellbeing board as well, which is where everybody writes down things that have happened to them that they're really celebrating. It might be that a student's understood a skill in their lesson or it might be that somebody gave them a hug that day Whatever it is, it goes on the board and then I take a photo of the board and send it around to everybody at the end of term. I focus on reducing their workload as teachers and I just think that wellbeing and workload go hand in hand and often it can seem quite tokenistic if you're giving your team some chocolate on a Friday, for example, but expecting them to stay late to do things that they shouldn't really be staying late to do. And as a result of everything that's going on here, we are now seen as the flagship department of the school we get the best results every year the students enjoy our subject and they can see that we are really tight as a team as well and that has a huge impact on the well-being of the team and, it, and it's quite infectious actually because we've got other members of the school now trying to come down and see what's going on and get involved in the action and teachers well-being and students well-being are two sides of the same coin and if teachers are not looking after their own well-being how can they possibly support students in their class to make progress and to support the well-being of their students as well and it really is a no-brainer for me if you have a happy staff body you are going to have teachers that are well equipped to do their lessons to teach their lessons and teachers that are well equipped to deal with the needs emotional needs behavioral needs and and the learning needs of the students that they have in front of them it would be crazy of anyone to think that somebody who is not well themselves physically and mentally is able to cope with the really demanding job 
of, of dealing with many students who are probably facing similar issues.